Welcome everyone to American University Korea event. My name is Ji Young Lee. I am an associate professor of international relations and CW Lim, KF professor of Korean studies at the School of International Service. I am very honored um, today to be joined by Dr. Meredith Sho, joining us from Japan, who will share with us her fascinating research on North Korean propaganda. I'm also very thankful that Junki Nakahara will serve as our discussant of the talk. Um, before we get started, let me briefly cover two housekeeping items. First, this event will last for about 75 minutes. Uh, we will start with the speaker's presentation, followed by comments from our discussant. We will also have Q&A at the end um, for about 15 minutes. Please submit your question through the chat function, um, the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. And second, uh, please do not record the event. Um, SIS Office of Research will be recording the session. And I understand that the plan is to, making this, uh, to make this available publicly at a later point. Um, now, let me introduce our speaker and discussant. Meredith Sho is an associate professor in the Institute of Social Science at the University of Tokyo and the managing editor of Social Science Japan Journal. Her work examines cultural politics and state efforts to manipulate culture in East Asia. Her research has been published in Journal of Conflict Resolution, the Pacific Review, and the Journal of East Asian Studies. And she has also written for the National Interest, Global Asia, and The Diplomat. Dr. Shaw worked for several years as a research assistant and translator at the Korea Institute for National Unification before obtaining a PhD in political science and international relations from University of Southern California. In her spare time, um, she maintains the North Korean Literature in English blog project. And um, let me see if I can share and show you this very cool website here. Okay. And um, Junki Nakahara, our discussant, is a PhD candidate at the at American University's School of Communication. Her research focuses on nationalism and xenophobia in East Asian context, critical and cultural studies, feminist media studies, and international relations. Her research has been published in the Asia Pacific Journal, Japan Focus, and New Media and Society. She has recently contributed a book chapter on sanctions as war and Thai imperialist perspectives on American geoeconomic strategy. Nakahara received her BED degree in educational psychology from the University of Tokyo and her MA in international, intercultural and international communication from American University. So without further ado, let me invite our speaker, Meredith Show, for her talk. Thank you um, for that introduction. And I am going to share my, my slideshow um, while I talk. Is that, um, is the slideshow up? Yes. OK. Uh, so yes, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm really glad uh, to be able to share this research, especially um, on this particular date, which uh, some of you might know is the um, 110th anniversary of Kim Il-sung's birthday, um, the day of the sun in North Korea. So it's very uh, meaningful that I am talking about a subject uh, that has a lot to do with that date. Uh, today, North Korean uh, propaganda, internal domestic propaganda. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about my research on historical novels in North Korea that uh, these are produced under the auspices of the Korean Workers Party. Uh, some background about this project. 
Uh, I started reading North Korean literature about six years ago, uh, originally as a way to, I wanted to sort of teach myself uh, the North Korean dialect and how it compares with South Korean language. Uh, but the more I read these stories and as a, a student of political science, I began thinking that they reveal a pretty interesting little window into the regime that doesn't get a lot of attention. So I started thinking that this could be something that I could add to the literature uh, that uh, non-Korean speakers maybe don't have access to. So I started my blog, uh, which you mentioned, and I also published a few papers. The novels that I look at are mostly um, from the high profile immortal history and immortal leadership series, which are written only by the most elite writers, the uh, April 15th writers group. Um, and they are often mandatory reading for party members and elites. Uh, I've heard some defectors say that they used to have to read these novels and discuss them at their union meetings, uh, which are a really important part of the North Korean party organizational life. Um, and another advantage of studying novels as opposed to news broadcasts or documentaries is that they can be more flexible and more inventive in describing the uh, kind of the internal thoughts and motivations of the people involved. Um, they uh, are also published usually several years after the events have actually happened. So even though they're understood as, as historical novels, you'll follow a character's thoughts the way you would in, in, a, in a fictional novel, but they're, they're supposed to be understood as reality to the reader. So um, this represents, you can think of it as the settled narrative that the regime comes up with several years after the uh, summit or whatever has happened, as opposed to the immediate aftermath. My most recent article, um, which I, I think is linked in the um, invitation, uh, it looks at how North Korean fiction has depicted three types of uh, foreign external pressure um, on the regime. These are uh, diplomatic summits, economic sanctions and military exercises. So I chose these three types because of the way they tend to be discussed in our media in terms of sending a message to the regime. Um, this article, this idea particularly struck me from watching the media coverage surrounding uh, former President Trump's summit meetings with Kim Jong-un. I noticed in the Western media, a lot of angst about what sort of message the summit should send or will send to North Koreans. This is just one example uh, from the Atlantic Monthly, but you see a lot of talk about how this is going to uh, give the dictator uh, um, kind of legitimacy and uh, transform his image in a way that benefits the regime. And uh, I like this. The idea that uh, you know the, the remember the video that that the uh, Trump delegation came up with for North Korea saying like oh they're giving them this video that they can air on their TV and so it's a propaganda victory and you know some of this uh, some of this analysis it's not wrong but from my perspective as someone who watches North Korean TV and reads a lot of North Korean literature is really kind of missing the point when it comes when it comes to a really important foreign uh, event like this, North Korea has absolute control over their domestic narrative. No matter what happens, they're gonna look good. If the summit gets canceled, they're gonna make it look good for them. Um, they control what everything that their people are gonna see and hear about this summit. You know, they, They're gonna control the horizontal, they're gonna control the vertical. North Co Korean media is not going to be caught by surprise by some remark about human rights or some such at the summit. And they're actually much more adept at making their own propaganda videos. In fact, they did make a very nice propaganda uh, documentary uh, about the summit meeting that they've aired many times on their TV. Um, as to my knowledge, they never showed the, the Trump video domestically in North Korea. So I started thinking about 
the different messages that we try to send to North Korea and looking at the different ways that these messages might get received on their end through a medium like um, state fiction, which is directed at the, uh, the internal audience. So looking first at summits and how they are treated in North Korean novels, a good place to start is the 1994 Jimmy Carter summit uh, that helped resolve the first nuclear crisis. Um, there are several high profile novels covering those events, which uh, that by itself shows this was a very successful summit from the North Korean point of view. They diffused a crisis and they got some major promises of energy assistance. So they write about it at length and in relatively rich detail in the novels. Um, like this, for example, now I'm gonna break my own rule here and some of these slides are gonna have a lot of text because um, I just don't know any other way to do it with uh, talking about text analysis like this, but I'll try to go slow so you can have a, a chance to read. Um, so this is one of the techniques that I find interesting. Uh, here I'm comparing the main North Korean novel depicting the summit and uh, the memoir that was written by Carter's aide, Marion Creekmore. Um, and you can see here how at this particular point where Kim Il-sung is talking with Jimmy Carter on the river cruise, um, you can find quotes in both stories that line up really nicely like this. Um, so you can see, okay, this is where obviously they had a transcript or a recording or something. And then there are times when they really diverge um, into uh, the propaganda line. Um, and, but, but it's really nice that sometimes you can see these very neat parallels, even though this is you know, my translation on the left and, and probably somebody else's translation on the right, um, you can tell that this is to some extent real. So reading this novel, I, I really get the sense that the author was given a verbatim transcript to work with, as well as some biographies of Carter, they also seem to have access to recordings of phone calls and conversations that President Carter made in his hotel room. Um, there are some quotes from the summit meeting that, that match very closely, but then of course they diverge very sharply at other times. And then they'll uh, take artistic license showing uh, the Carter's internal thoughts and reactions. The Carters play a dual role in these novels. Uh, they're negotiating partners, but they're also important foreign witnesses viewing the city and the, the North Korean leader through foreign eyes. So the story at times takes on a travelogue feel. Uh, Jimmy Carter is, is cruising down the river and, and Kim Il-sung is showing him all the great sights of Pyongyang. And of course the Carters are blown away by everything that they see. Um, and their perspective is valuable because they're foreigners. Like this passage here where uh, Jimmy Carter says, I've traveled all over the world, but I don't think I've ever seen a leader who serves his people as sincerely or people who revere their leader as much as they do here. Um, and so you can see that because he's a man of the world and he's traveled, his opinion has this weight that they don't usually get in their you know, to depict in their fiction. So, uh, so they're taking advantage of that. Uh, the passage is also striking for its uh, casual biblical references. Um, here, the reader is clearly expected to know who Jesus and Judas are without any further um, description. In fact, this novel focuses a lot on the Carter's Christianity and how that leads them to be more open-minded towards North Korean ideology of Juche in, the, in this novel, uh, as they talk to Kim Il-sung and they start to see, hey, Juche is a lot like Christianity, so maybe we should listen. Um, and I was able to get in touch with a really valuable source, the official State Department translator for this summit, uh, uh, Dick Christensen. And in fact, he verified that the discussions of Christianity were some of the most fascinating moments in this uh, summit. He told me, uh, this is a quote, 
Kim and Carter talked of Christianity in old Pyongyang. Kim showed familiarity and comfort with Christianity and Carter was clearly moved. Carter of course knew that Kim Il-sung was not now Christian, but Kim's positive interpretation of it and their ability to talk earnestly about it was impressive to witness. And this conversation struck me as the central bonding experience. So thinking of that, it's interesting to see that, this, uh, that these novels in North Korea don't shy away from the discussion of Christianity at the summit, but they frame it really positively in terms of making the Carters more humanistic and more open-minded than the godless politicians back in Washington. And this is really striking because as you may know, there are a lot of other novels in North Korea where Christians are not so nice, especially missionaries can be depicted as really malicious and cruel. So it's, it's really interesting to see this, uh, but when it's a foreign uh, diplomat and a true Christian, they, they seem to be very, uh, uh, very open-minded and, and, and earnest. Um, so this slide, uh, this passage is interesting. This is from a different short story about the same summit that is told entirely from Rosalind Carter's perspective. Um, uh, so there, she's talking with her husband um, and he's just told her that they're going to Pyongyang and she asks him why, and he's like, you know, you, you know why. Um, and she tells him, uh, I, I don't think this is a good idea. I don't like it. Uh, I read that, you know, North Korea is, um, uh, that this is Judas kiss diplomacy. So there's a Judas reference again. Uh, we'll never work with North Korea. And she's saying, you know, we should, we should just stick to what we know, which is firm and ruthless diplomacy. Um, so in this story, um, she's kind of the voice of reason a lot of the time. And her husband is kind of more of a kind of bumbling, you know, well-intentioned, but bumbling guy. So it's really interesting that her character has that role. Um, and I, I think uh, uh, her presence at the summit really threw them for a loop in North Korea. There's, uh, <laughs> I guess they had a, a, a luncheon and all these top North Korean uh, officials, all of them brought their wives to the luncheon, which is really unusual. And this picture uh, is the about the only picture you can find on Google of Kim Il-sung's wife. It's just about the only picture that exists of her. So that gives you an idea of how rarely she was ever in public, but they seem to have trotted her out for the summit. So, um, so I think having that female perspective is really rare and they seized uh, advantage of that in the fiction. Um, and she's also sort of an intermediary figure. She's more, she seems more canny, but also more respectful of North Korea than her husband. And at the end, she feels a sense of personal crisis as she realizes that she admires Kim Il-sung more than uh, any American president, including her own husband. Um, and one other important thing to note here is that once the Carters have met and spoken with the leader, they both become sympathetic characters uh, who want to do the right thing. Uh, this is a firm rule in North Korean literature. Nobody can talk directly with the leader without being completely won over and transformed. So, but the story still needs a bad guy, right? Because you know things didn't work out in the end. So, um, so Carter is portrayed as sort of weak, but well-intentioned and earnest. And he's constantly being undermined by uh, uh, shadowy forces back in Washington that don't want uh, the summit to succeed. Um, and after his first meeting, he has some harsh words with his Washington counterparts in a late night phone call. They tell him that he's being too soft and that some of them think he's actually a traitor. Uh, and he gets really angry and he yells at them on the phone and he says, you know, listen, you people who have never met Kim Il-sung, you don't know what you're talking about. So the, the key is you have to meet Kim Il-sung and then you become uh, an evangelist for Kim Il-sung um, and you can no longer be evil. And from what I gather, that phone call actually happened. Uh, parts of it 
are accurate to the transcript and others are, are clearly invented so that Carter comes off sounding very reasonable and sympathetic and uh, Bob Gallucci on the other end of the line and, and uh, Tony Lake on the other end of the line, they both sound really hysterical. Um, but you know, there, there was a, a late night phone call. So some of that is true. What happened? Um, so this contrasts with the uh, depiction of uh, President Clinton's delegation in 2009. Uh, that was a much less satisfying summit from North Korea's perspective. Um, and it shows in the novel, they didn't get around to publishing a novel covering that summit until about five years later. And um, it's actually only one short chapter in that novel. Um, while the Carter stories both uh, really zoom in on some details about the Carters and, and portray them uh, as very uh, fleshed out characters, this novel largely almost completely ignores Clinton and instead it tells the story through the eyes of a uh, fabricated character, uh, this delegation member named Conan, who uh, works for the State Department, but he's really a, a CIA operative um, and he's this very nefarious character. Um, and so his perspective is that he studied Korean, he studied Korean culture, he's learned that Koreans are this, you know, ne gang, that they're, you know, hard uh, on the inside, strong on the inside, but with a soft shell. Um, and uh, he, after this meeting with uh, Kim Jong-il, he realizes that North Koreans are uh, strong and hard, both on the inside and on the outside. So um, again, you have uh, the foreigner lending this useful perspective as an outsider observing in this case, the comparing between South and North Korean cultures. And um, I like this, this last line. I think the author might have been deliberately trolling President Clinton with the, uh, with the last phrase there, which I translated as, I feel your pain. Um, there's, there's always evidence in these novels that the, that the novelist was given some uh, Clinton biographies to read, so it's possible that, that that was on purpose, but it could be a coincidence. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can translate that. Uh, I just prefer to think that it was on purpose. Now, uh, the book on President Trump's summit meeting has not been written yet, but from this past precedent, we can guess how it will shape out. Trump was seen meeting and talking with the leader, so he cannot be a bad guy ever again. Um, but the summit didn't achieve what North Korea wanted. So uh, if I had to guess, I would imagine they will probably use some representation again of the shadowy globalist uh, capitalist forces that are uh, working to bring down the summit behind the scenes. And um, I'm guessing that uh, they'll probably highlight Trump's age and make him seem like he's like too weak to really shape US policy. Like, uh, like Jimmy Carter in his novels. So you can anticipate how that's gonna happen if there is a novel. Um, moving along to the uh, second type of message that we see uh, that we often hear sent to North Korea is through military exercises or fleet movements, uh, whether we decide to hold them or cancel them um, some, uh, most of you will be aware that this is always a huge issue for North Korea. It's probably the single biggest reason that uh, kind of tanked Moon Jae-in's uh, North Korean policies was that he could never um, cancel the military exercises. Um, so some people might say this isn't really a message because, you know, they're annual exercises and uh, it's kind of common sense for a military alliance to have them, but then you also sometimes see comments like these. Um, this was right after the Chunan uh, ship sinking in 2010, um, and they're talking about how they need a show of force to send a signal to North Korea and uh, to, designed to show that it has to change its behavior. Um, 
So there, there's some of that rhetoric, uh, but it's a little bit less obvious. Um, so looking at the novels, um, uh, the team spirit military exercises uh, in, North, in North Korean fiction are often depicted as America's way of putting the military hardware in place in uh, preparation for an invasion. A classic example is this very famous novel, which again takes place in the 90s. Um, and uh, here, uh, President Clinton is having a meeting with, I think, with the Joint Chiefs. And he, uh, they're talking about what to do about Operation Focus, which is their code name for this plan that Clinton has come up with that he's going he's gonna, to um, use the Team Spirit Joint Military Exercises to get everything in place and then have a, a targeted strike of the nuclear facility, Yongbyon. And then they expect that North Korea will respond to that and then that will give them an excuse to launch a full-fledged war um, so you can see how this depiction is useful to north korea the novels are teaching that uh, joint military exercises are always cover for an invasion that could happen at any time so you have to constantly be prepared um, and they symbolize both the perpetual threat of war and uh, American perf perfidiousness. Um, and, uh, but this passage, you can interpret it a different way because it also hints at a certain preference for stability. It sets up a scenario in which retaliation is not the wisest course of action. In fact, uh, Clinton wants them to retaliate he repeatedly frets in the novel that maybe, you know, what if they don't attack the way we want, uh, then I won't have uh, an excuse to go to war. And uh, in this novel, there's a lot of character development of President Clinton. He's depicted as uh, really obsessed with his legacy and he sees defeating North Korea as his way to achieve what no US president has ever done before. So um, here again, the first lady appears as the sort of calmer voice of reason. She's done a lot more research on North Korea and she sort of warns her husband that North Korea is too strong and too smart for him. Uh, in fact, Hillary Clinton is one of the more interesting characters in North Korean fiction because she changes as uh, in successive novels as, as she takes on different roles in different novels. In this particular novel, she's a, a fairly sympathetic character, but she gets a lot more evil over time, especially when she's Secretary of State. Um, so it's, you know, it's interesting when they have to re revisit old characters that have been named in previous novels. Uh, but I digress from uh, that, the main point. Um, so, Another interesting novel uh, talks about the U.S. fleet movements in uh, this one. This one is um, a novel about the Kwangmyong Song 2 uh, missile launch, uh, satellite launch that happened back in April 2009. And um, this was one of those rare launches that we had kind of a lot of warning for. So. Um, the US and Japan moved their destroyers into the area. Uh, and they said at the time, they announced that they didn't have any plan to try to intercept the missile unless it was gonna like imminently hit Japan. But they just wanted to kind of do it to test how well they could scramble and, and to see like, you know, how well can we sight it and just basically practice. Um, but they announced ahead of time that they're not gonna try to intercept the missile. Uh, so the North Korean um, treat, literary treatment of this came out in uh, 2014, um, so like five years later. Um, and in this novel, there are some interesting scenes from the US side. Um, what happens basically is uh, Admiral Timothy Ke Keating, who is the uh, Pacific commander at the time, uh, he really wants to use this missile launch as an excuse to launch a preemptive strike and a total war. Um, and, uh, but when the, the US gets all of its ships and destroyers into place, 
then uh, Kim Jong-un arranges to have this squadron of, of MiGs uh, fly in some exercise formations over the US fleet and it scares the hell out of them. And so o Obama just kind of panics and um, backs down from the whole plan. And, and so there's a lot of good depiction here of the US uh, government kind of divided between this hawkish Pentagon uh, people and a more weak and timid civilian government. It's an uh, interesting portrayal of uh, the politics there. Um, I think this demonstrates how fleet and troop movements are used to bolster the, the leader's military credentials, especially for Kim Jong-un, who never even lived through an actual war. Um, it gives him an opportunity to show himself in a, in a leadership military command position, giving orders and making strategy. And um, these stories really build up how uh, the exercises mean that war is imminent. The U.S. is moving in for a big battle, but then the leader does something and scares them off. Um, it's actually really important to be able to depict Kim Jong-un doing this sort of thing because, uh, like I said, he has no real war experience. Um, in fact, there's no evidence that he actually was at that launch in 2009, but um, this story... Uh, that was written much later paints him into a commanding role. Uh, so it gives him that kind of retroactive credentials. Um, the maneuver with the MiGs is really interesting because I can't find any real information about it, but in um, 2015, around the same time that this novel was published, there was a brief report from North Korean media about Kim Jong-un attending a memorial ceremony for 14 fighter pilots who died, uh, quote, ensuring the successful launch of the Kwang Yong Sung II. Um, I can't find, I can't, I'm not a military expert, so I can't think of what purpose MiGs would even have at a, at a missile launch or how they would have died and nobody knew about it until six years later. But uh, the timing of this story coming out, which really highlights this, these heroic MiG fighters, and then that little bitty report about um, a memorial service for some, some fighters uh, makes me wonder if there's something to it. So I'm really curious to find out more about that, um, uh, hopefully in the future. Um, so finally, the, the third type of, of message that I look at is economic sanctions. I think it's fair to say that sanctions are usually about uh, sending a message to the regime uh, or to its people, um, but it's also, uh, it's really one of the more popular subjects in North Korean fiction. The novels depict sanctions both through the decisions at the state level and uh, the experience of the suffering North Koreans on the ground. Um, the US policymakers are always described as fanatical and crazed when they push for sanctions. Um, Japan is also sometimes shown really pushing for even harsher sanctions because they're so scared of North Korea's potential. Um, other countries are shown as not really enthusiastic, but they uh, kind of have to go along with it because they have no other choice because the US is so strong, but they're kind of secretly uh, really impressed with North Korea for standing up to them. And, and you know they wish they could help, but they couldn't basically. Um, so uh, looking back at that novel about the Carter summit, um, here we have a scene where Jimmy Carter has just revealed the, uh, that the U.S. is willing to back off of the U.N. sanctions re resolution that was on the table. And so this is his big bargaining chip that he's held back until this moment. And he expects, like, when he reveals it, there's going to be a big response from Kim Il-sung. But uh, Kim Il-sung just kind of looks bored and rolls his eyes. And, he, and then he says to him, he says, uh, we're not afraid of sanctions. We've survived under sanctions for all this time. Uh, we've been under sanctions for so long, we don't even really notice them anymore. Uh, whether you withdraw the sanctions or not, we're fine either way. 
So um, I was interested. Uh, again, here I, I verified with the official translator, US translator's notes. And um, he said that something like this was said at the summit, but it was actually the foreign ministry officials and not Kim Il-sung who said it. But uh, anyway, this, this quote has become canonical in North Korean literature and uh, media coverage. Uh, and so since it's attributed to the great leader, it's like a gospel now. And uh, interestingly, I, I heard somebody, one of the Russian foreign ministers say almost exactly the same thing the other day. So this is, uh, this, you know, this is a, a good line, I guess, that, you know, when you're trying to tell people you don't care about sanctions, even though, you know, they probably do care quite a lot about sanctions. Um, so that, that was just interesting. Uh, there's uh, other times when uh, sanctions are depicted as a sign of the capitalist world's fear of North Korea's potential. Um, and some of the more minor sanctions or targets are, are sort of ridiculed. Like there's this story uh, about Japan um, had uh, that talks about when Japan had to crack down on some people who were illegally smuggling in North Korean matsutake mushrooms. And uh, this was illegal, um, but there, there's a novel where this is portrayed as uh, just senseless and paranoid. And uh, I like when they say uh, it was as if the Japanese authorities saw these mushrooms as some sort of special forces, or perhaps they thought the stems were missiles and the caps were the DPRK's increasingly advanced miniaturized ballistic warheads. At any rate, the Japanese archipelago was a flutter over these mushrooms. So they're kind of, uh, it's kind of portraying them as paranoid uh, and, and nonsensical and they just can't, you know, get control of themselves. So they, they impose sanctions. Where did I go? Um, at other times, the uh, sanctions are depicted as signs of uh, the capital, the um, sanctions are depicted as uh, indirect positive development in that they kind of force North Koreans to practice uh, self-reliance self and develop their own technology. So there are a lot of stories like this one um, where a uh, factory can't get the part it needs uh, or the technology it needs because of sanctions. Uh, but then in the end, they figure out a way to make the technology on their own. And um, they actually do a better job than the foreign company would have done. And, uh, and then usually like uh, the leader makes a speech saying, you know, I'm proud of this more than if you had imported the part because this means that you were, ab that you were able to triumph over the tough circumstances of sanctions that makes it all the more um, precious that makes it all the more great of an achievement. Um, so this is part of the theme of developing by our own strength. That is a major slogan of Kim Jong-un um, in the last five years. And such stories uh, also serve to demonstrate the ideal values that the party wishes to see its citizens emulate. Um, namely self-sacrifice, ingenuity, personal initiative, local self-sufficiency, and mutual support wherever possible in the face of sanctions. The existence of external sanctions gives them a rally around the flag effect that makes such sacrifices as they're making seem more palatable because uh, they're, you know, they're, they're resisting against a foreign force. It's not just their government is bad and makes things uh, terrible for them. It's, it's that these foreign powers are trying to make them poor. And so we have to persevere. Um, it also probably helps to make up for the deficiencies of North Korean equipment. Uh, Cause the idea is like, sure, this tractor maybe doesn't run very great but it was built under the weight of all those sanctions. So just imagine what we could do if we, if the U.S. would just leave us alone. So they have that message as well. So this all seems to back up the theory that in the long run, external sanctions are more likely to enhance the nationalist legitimacy of rulers 
rather than undermine it. And particularly in response to uh, long-term economic sanctions, North Korean propaganda has learned how to leverage North Koreans' pride in their cultural characteristics of frugality, inventiveness, and defiance of a much bigger, more powerful state uh, in this way. So um, that concludes my prepared remarks for today. I'm happy to take uh, your questions in discussion and I can also go into some more detail about the, uh, the Korean Writers Union and the bureaucracy and how fiction gets written uh, if anyone's interested. But for now, I will turn things over to my discussant and uh, I will stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you so much, Meredith, for that fascinating um, presentation of your research. I really have learned a lot. Um, why don't I go ahead and invite our discussant, Junki Nakahara, for her remarks. Thank you, Professor Lee, for the introduction. And good morning and good evening, everyone. I'm Junki Nakahara, a PhD candidate in the School of Communication. It's my great honor to serve as a discussant for this research talk. Dr. Shaw's article focuses on state-produced literature fiction, which has been neglected or unpopular in previous re relevant studies. So this choice of media text I think makes this study very fascinating and unique. And as Dr. Shaw clearly explains its significance in the article, literary works can be more flexible and interpretive than news broadcasts that have to provide an immediate reaction to each event surrounding the North Korean regime. And I also believe they, those works, literary works, help us understand how the regime tries to reproduce and reinforce the masses image of and attachment to their leaders in everyday context, not by pure coercion from above. And with a very nuanced analysis of North Korean fiction, this article succeeds in showing how the regime shapes internal narratives about foreign affairs to legitimize their version of, let's say, manufactured consent, as well as to delegitimize <clears throat> some alternative framing of those events. And I would also note that this article carefully acknowledges the, some challenges facing North Korea related research, primarily due to the limited access to a broad sample of North Korean consumers or audience of state propaganda and take multiple or even alternative explanations into consideration. So based on this article, I would like to discuss two points or two aspects that may be worth delving into. First, so it was very interesting to read how Kim Jong-il, especially, was not only the main character or protagonist in state-produced fiction, and how his work experienced at the propaganda and the ag agitation department might have shaped his view of effective propaganda that does not necessarily rely on coercion. And I personally found that Kim Jong-il's remark related to state-produced music and art saying you cannot, basically saying you cannot move people by making the lyrics that are full of political jargon. If the lyrics are too hard or too formal, people will be disinterested and will not sing or listen to the song. And also it, so music and art must reflect independent human thought and be understandable and enjoyable to all the masses. So to me, he seemed to, let's say, regard typical propaganda that deals directly with politics or political events as somehow useless. And I believe this is also to some extent applicable in the case of fiction literature as well. Then my puzzle here is what is politics or what is political in the minds of North Korean leaders and authors and what is perceived by those propaganda producers as 
politics or political for the audience or for the people? And was there any shift in what it means to be <clears throat> political over time? And in fact, many events described in those fiction novels include summits, which are a space for international politics or diplomacy, or more specifically conversations between national leaders like Carter and Kim, and UN sanctions or US imperialism and international order against North Korea's so-called self-determination, etc. So what's interesting to me here is to think about how the regime may or may not deliberately and strategically select those <clears throat> seemingly political events from our perspective, or let's say draw the line between international politics that are understandable and enjoyable for the people, for the audience, and those not. So unfortunately, it's extremely difficult to conduct an audience reception study in this case, but at least it will be very important to look at how North Korean leaders treat their people, not merely as the passive audience of top-down propaganda, and whose people are also expected to have a set of knowledge, like particular type and depth and variety of knowledge to actively decode the media text. Although the primary audience could be elites, it seems that to me, ordinary and common citizens are by no means excluded from this kind of media consumption. And secondly, the article focuses on three forms of messaging from outside of North Korea, economic sanctions, summit diplomacy, and the military exercises. And I have been thinking about another, maybe fourth type of messaging that will potentially be filtered and interpreted by the North Korean regime, which is Western media's coverage or news coverage of sanctions and other events related to North Korea. And I recently had an, an opportunity to study how US news coverage of economic sanctions against North Korea, Iran, and Venezuela not only serves the interest of the power elite, the country's political, corporate, and military brass, but also reinforces the legitimacy of US hegemony in global politics by delegitimizing or even demonizing socialist or former socialist countries. And in addition, I have also seen especially in Japanese media, Japanese popular media, North Korea is always depicted as, let's say, strange or abnormal, and it's an, always an object of people's curiosity, ridicule, and even othering. So, for example, some events or those leaders' remarks are reported with a quite sensational and dramatized voiceover. I wouldn't necessarily think that the North Korean regime worries too much about its people's exposure to that kind of foreign media coverage. But I do believe they, the regime has the capacity, the ability to gather and analyze, then use it in their propaganda. So I would like to hear Dr. Shaw's opinion later if time allows. And in addition to this, these two points, I also have a very quick question, um, which is Dr. Shaw runs a website titled North Korean Literature in English, which I really enjoyed exploring. And it would be great if you could expand a little bit on some challenges or limitations in translating North Korean literary works into English. I'm asking this because the primary target of those literary works is domestic audience as discussed in the, in the article. So I believe those producers or authors may expect certain shared culture or background knowledge or mindsets among their people within the country. And their assumptions about the audience could be reflected in the wording or phrasing in their works. Sometimes I think explicitly, but in many cases, I guess, in a quite implicit manner, which I think could cause some challenges. That's all for my comments. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Junki. Um, I think um, she actually has um, raised many, um, you know, several uh, interesting and important uh, points. Um, Meredith, would you like to see if you would like to respond to some of those quickly before we go to the questions? And again, a uh, reminder, audience, uh, please, um, you know, type up your question using the Q and A. Um, function uh, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. OK, um, thank you for all of those um, really uh, great questions. Um, so I'll try to answer quickly uh, some of them. Uh, what is political and where is where do you draw the line between political and artistic in these works? Uh, that is a really central point of um, the North Korean uh, entire artistic bureaucracy, um, not just the writers union, but the, as you mentioned, the music and the play, the playwriting and the art and everything is, um, you know, Kim Jong Il was the one who really codified this idea that art should serve the state um, and that uh, art for art's sake is decadent um, and that, that that's what separates North Korea from South Korea. South Koreans are just making art, to, making music to have fun and be silly and uh, that it's actually decadent of them to do that. So this is a uh, really interesting um, way that North Korea sets itself apart. And it's it's com it's come to be a point of friction, I understand, when in the past they've tried to have like joint concerts um, between, you know, friendship concerts between North and South Korea. And the South Korean audience comes off really offended by all of the political indoctrination that they they perceive in these songs and, and uh, movies and things. Um, the issue of, you know, how to draw the line between, uh, you know, what, what is the audience getting out of this and does the audience uh, enjoy it in some way? Are they, you know, does the art serve to please the audience or not? Um, the, the general impression that I get, which is heavily um, informed by South Korean scholars, is that uh, North Korea there is no feedback from the audience in terms of like, they're, they're never gonna look at like, okay, this this novel sold well, so we should write more of this, or, you know, this novel, there, there's not nothing of, of a reader response in the sense of like, I want more love stories, or I want more of this or that. It's all, you know, the party decides what the what is gonna be the next move in uh, literature. Now, I, I have the caveat that a lot of this is is coming to me from South Korean scholars who might not entirely be neutral, um, but that's the impression that I get that there there's not really uh, audience pleasing element to it. Um, the idea of Western media and Japanese media as a fourth type of pressure, um, yeah. The I don't know what you mean by by pressure exactly but there but media coverage is really interesting to see in the stories um because they really a lot of um a lot of times that when a big event happens like a summit they'll linger on the cameras and the the cnn reporters and they'll you know really emphasize that oh the whole world is holding its breath seeing what uh, North Korea is going to do, and everybody's so so um, it, so awestruck by North Korea, um, and Western media has a big role in that. So, you know, obviously they don't. Um, you know, they, there's a certain portrayal of Western media as being capitalist and not trustworthy. But then when they when um, they can point to a CNN report or a Reuters report that says something they like, they'll always do that. Um, so they definitely know CNN is a big name and Reuters is a big name and they, they want that um, recognition. Uh, and then some, some novels will depict um, reporters in really interesting ways, reporters trying to get the story and 
the reporters aren't always aren't bad guys. They're, you know, they they are persuaded by what they see and hear in North Korea. So they're not just there for gotcha journalism in the stories, um, which is really interesting to me. <laughs> um, because I, if I were a propagandist, I would have gone in a different direction. But uh, what do I know? Um, so uh, I think the North Korea can and does use use the foreign media when it sees something that it likes. It's really um, useful to them, and it re or really makes them feel good about themselves. Um, and um, finally, uh, the challenge of uh, translating for this blog. So yeah, I mean, I'm not a native Korean speaker, so. I uh, started this as in hopes that my Korean ability would get better. And especially I, wa I wanted to learn North Korean uh, dialect and phrases. And so, you know, there's always, um, there's, I always have two sets of notes. There's the new vocabulary that's just new Korean. And then there's the new vocabulary that's specifically North Korean. And fortunately neighbor dictionary has almost everything. So I can usually find if I look hard enough. I talk in the blog about a few things that that I really had to look hard to figure out what they were talking about. Um, but you know that that can be fun as well because you know when it when it comes clear, uh, there was one story about manure about about making um, making uh, fertilizer that had a lot of special vocabulary that was really difficult for me to find anywhere. And, uh, you know, there are some idioms that are really interesting when you see them and they're a little bit different from the South Korean idiom and, um, or, you know, are completely different. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to, to see when that happens. So yeah, I, it's been a, a challenge, but I, I, think, uh, I, I think I'm getting a little better as time goes on. And um, I hope that uh, you find it and if you find my struggles enjoyable as well. I don't claim to be a perfect translator, so I'm sure there are some mistakes in there, but I do my best. Thank you so much. Um, we do have several questions uh, raised um, um, as, as we were listening to um, Meredith speaking and answering um, Junki's comments. Let me actually bundle the three questions from Nathan, Noah, and Hannah. Um, thank you for the interesting talk. How are these novels distributed? And then the second question, how much is this literature read and distributed? Is it for pleasure on academic context, limited to elites or all people? And the third question, Somewhat related, what is the process of state fiction writing? Who sanctions what is appropriate to write? And how is an author chosen to write a novel? Yeah, all good Some questions. of the internal workings of the yeah, production. So I talk about it more in the article. Um, so I, I you know, abbreviated it for the talks, but it's this is really, uh, the heart of of my research in some respects. I uh, so some things are easy to answer. The dis the distribution it depends on the book. These books that I talked about today are really high profile, so they get a special distribution um, that they get sent out. So you can register with the Korean Writers Union as a literary correspondent, and if you do that, they will send you the books. And then I understand that people in certain party offices are expected to read them and are just expected to buy them in bookstores or buy them at, or get them at their local library. Um, but sometimes they're hard to find. Uh, and then in the last five to eight, eight years, I, you know, depending on which book, they've really started putting a lot of things up on uh, as audiobooks or as, um, you know, as, as eBooks on their internal, um, I guess, whatever it is that they use for their smartphones. So they have an internal network for that. Um, so now it's, um, you can download uh, whole novels, not, not all of them, but increasingly more and more of the famous novels are, able, are available for download. And then the 
the short stories, the two main uh, literary magazines that I mostly look at, the Chosun Munak and Cheongnyeon Munak. And those are like about, the, you know, they're, they're like magazine thickness um, and they come out every month. Uh, and you can find them in a lot of university libraries. Um, and they, you know, in North Korea, those are distributed to all of the Korean Writers Union offices and bookstores um, and libraries. So, you know, they, there is a very elaborate distribution system. I understand that this sort of fell apart a little bit in the late 90s and 2000s that, you know, paper quality got really bad and transportation issues happened. So, you know, sometimes uh, they don't get distributed as much. But um, so I understand that these novels, these, these really high level novels that would sort of depict foreign interactions, those um, I think at the elite level, you may be expected to read them. Um, I don't think that ordinary people have access to them. I've heard different accounts depending on who I talk to, which makes me think that if you're a relatively elite person living in Pyongyang, you probably think that everyone reads them, but people out in the boonies are like, I've never seen that before in my life. So, you know, it depends on who you talk to and what era they lived through. But I think there is, uh, you know, a, a certain assumption that below a certain, you know, certain elites are gonna always read them. And, you know, your average factory worker maybe would have more trouble uh, getting a hold of one. Um, and how the, um, how the uh, process happens, so who is appropriate to write. Um, I actually just recently posted about this. Um, there's, uh, so I've gotten a lot of uh, information from one particular defector who was in the Korean Writers Union and, um, and some other uh, things as well uh, that were, uh, that South Korean researchers told me. But basically the Korean Writers Union, um, you can register as a literary correspondent and then, you know, just about anybody can do this. And then you start writing stories. And once you're registered, you get to attend uh, about a month long seminar every year that um, they kind of guide you through and say, you know, this is how you write a good story. This is the sort of characteristics that you should talk about. Um, and, uh, and then they, you know, they evaluate your story and they say, oh, this is good. This, you know, you should change this. Uh, they evaluate it in terms of the ideological um, value of the story. And so, if you do a good job, you get published and in the Cheongnyeon Munak journal. And then if you get three stories published in Cheongnyeon Munak, you get to advance to like a part-time writer status and you get certain perks, like you get a travel pass through the country um, and you get like paid vacation for three months. You get a lot of perks. So people are trying to reach this level and they know that you have to write a certain style of story with a certain message to get published. So it's it's kind of a self, at that level, it's kind of a, a self-motivated uh, uh, propaganda. But then at the higher level, so these stories that I told you about today, these are all written by members of the April 15th writers group. Um, it, the name doesn't change every day. It just happens to be April 15th today. And that's the name of the writers group. Um, that these are the most elite writers in North Korea that have been around for a long time. They've published a lot of stories um, like Paek Nam Young, some of you might know. Um, he just wrote like the first uh, historical novel of the new series about Kim Jong-un. So they, they get their most elite writers to, you know, only the most elite writers can write about the leaders. Anyone at a lower level can write about, you know, the workers in South Korea, or they can write about like some battle in world in in like the Korean War. Um, but you know, there are certain topics that that tend to get rewarded, and so that you know they're going to produce a lot of stories like that. Um, and yeah, I could go on at length, but that's in a nutshell that it's it's a hierarchy that you climb up. Mm. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from David. 
Is there a contradiction in the North Korean public about discrepancy between state published literature and illegally imported South Korean media? If so, what are their reactions to such discrepancy? How does the state respond other than punitive measure to control people? Hmm, I wouldn't really be in a position to answer that. Um, there's obviously a huge discrepancy between uh, state, pro state produced literature and anything they might see in uh, South Korean media. Um, and uh, so, you know, you can hear defector reports that, you know, oh, I heard that South Koreans were so poor. And uh, when I got to South Korea, they were, you know, I found out that they're, you know, or, or when I watched South Korean dramas, that's when I learned that they were, uh, you know, that our stories were, were lies. Um, and yeah, they, obviously the state doesn't like to have this alternative narrative and there have been a lot of accounts of how they've cracked down on people uh, consuming uh, particularly South Korean media. Um, but there's also a sense, I think um, certain things aren't gonna really matter. Like if you watch a love story about South Korea, that's not really gonna be as important as if you see like, uh, uh, South Korean media report about the summit. So that, you know, those things are probably gonna be uh, more of a uh, cognitive dissonance. But I also think there's a tendency that gets overlooked in our analysis um, that people want to read stories that make them feel good about themselves and their country. Like they don't wanna believe that North Korea is this pariah, that, you know, all their, all of the things that they've been told are lies and that everyone's laughing at them. People don't want to believe that. So they want to believe the, the version that the state tells them mostly. And, um, you know, I think as, as Americans, we can relate to that. I think a lot of people can relate to that. So uh, this assumption that they're going to always want to read, you know, Voice of America or something and get the truth uh, is uh, you can't always assume that about people. And I think you know, yes, some people are gonna gonna listen to radio that tells them a different story, but I I suspect that the majority of people are still really influenced by the official narrative, and they want to believe it. Thank you. Um, so. These will be the last set. I think I can actually bundle two questions uh, from Michael. Is North Korean propaganda solely focused on political elements and dynamics? Are cultural social differences vis-a-vis -vis the West emphasized? For example, equality, family structure and role, views on life and employment, etc. And then the question from Audrey, I was just wondering to what extent North Koreans interact with American literature, music, movies, et cetera. Yeah, um, the, uh, so my research really zooms in on the political uh, novels. I should have made that more clear at the beginning. There are novels that are more, you know, talking about daily life and kind of humorous anecdotes about families. And a really great book to read if you want to learn more about that is um, Emmanuel Kim's uh, uh, book that came out. I can't remember the name of it, but um, it, it came out a few years ago uh, talking about um, uh, North Korean literature and depiction, you know, from more of a literary analysis point of view. I'm a political scientist and I really zoom in on the stories that talk about foreign affairs and political affairs. And, and that's, you know, not to say that it's the majority of novels even, um, you know, there's, there's a real strong tendency to kind of avoid international uh, settings and characters, unless you're at the top, top level. So, um, so yeah, you can find a lot of novels where they talk about, um, you know, Korean family life and uh, comparing with the West, um, that there's always a message of, uh, 
you know, the, that uh, foreign idea, foreign culture, foreign music, foreign dance is um, going to creep in and you have to resist it because, you know, it's not, you know, and that there's this idea that Korean music is in your blood and is in your heartbeat. And that if you bring this foreign music in, your heartbeat will change and, you know, things like that. So um, there, there's definitely uh, uh, an emphasis on, you know, maintaining the purity of Korean culture. And then especially in terms of South Korea saying South Korea has let all this foreign culture in and their culture has been diluted and you shouldn't pay attention to it. Um, so that's a, that's a very strong message that you can see in a lot of fiction that I just haven't, haven't really covered today. Um, and to the extent they can interact with American, American literature, not so much, um, unless they smuggle it in, but, um, foreign literature, I, so I've learned that the, the writers in the Korean Writers Union get access to a kind of like a secret vault of foreign novels that have been translated into Korean. So if you're a writer and you're training to be a writer, you can access like, um, oh, uh, like Alexandra Dumas or, or like uh, uh, Crime and Punishment, Tol Tolstoy, kind of a lot of Soviet writers, a lot of uh, kind of really famous French writers. I think they read like uh, um, maybe uh, some uh, some early American writers. Oh, oh, Henry is a popular one apparently. So there, there are certain approved books that they are given translated versions of to read to hone their craft as writers. But of course, nor normal people, ordinary people would not have access to that, uh, except for maybe some Soviet fiction, Soviet uh, literature, um, mu music and movies, uh, everything is obviously uh, banned, but uh, heavily smuggled. So um, depending on who you are and who you have access to, they would probably interact with a fair amount of that, I'm guessing. Thank you so very much. Um, we've learned some very fresh insights into foreign relations of North Korea and other political aspects through um, uh, the, the North Korean literature. Thank you so very much, Meredith, for joining us from Tokyo. Um, and thank you, Jun Ki, for sharing your uh, comments. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. And my special thanks go to the Office of um, Research uh, at SIS for all the behind the scenes efforts. This concludes our event today. Thank you, everyone, so much, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Bye bye.